for our um, time of prayer this week, um, I thought it would be good to just uh, pray through the Lord's Prayer. Um, so I'm going to read out um, the, the prayer and I'll leave gaps at appropriate places for you to um, add your own prayers to it. I'm going to be using the contemporary version, um, so it's without the these and the thys, um, but it, the words still mean the same. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The reading this morning is Psalm 119, verses 1 to 8. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart, and as I learn your righteous laws, I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. Let's um, pray before Chris brings us the message. Heavenly Father, I just pray now that you will open up our hearts, our minds. Um, Lord, take from our lives the things that are um, stopping us from, from hearing your word and from acting on it, Lord. And Lord, I pray now for um, Chris as he brings the word to us. Thank you for him and thank you for the way that you um, lay your word upon his heart for us every week. Amen. Well, thanks, Karen, and thanks to all of those that have contributed to this week's Worship at Home service, and a warm welcome to you wherever you're listening to this talk. Shame and guilt are crippling emotions. They can ruin our lives and even lead people to end their life. False shame and false guilt are used by others to control and manipulate us. Our own conscience condemns us for the things we've done or left undone. Our postmodern culture would have us reject all notions of right and wrong, seeking to free us from shame by denying that evil exists and to blame religion for any guilt that we do feel. But a world where everyone did whatever they wanted, without thought for others and without consequences, would quickly descend into chaos with the abuse of the weak by the strong. We should not desire to be shameless or unable to feel guilt that would lead us to be insensitive to the needs of others and their feelings and unaware of our offences before God. At the same time as denying any basis for true shame or guilt, the media and the general population through social media name and shame, condemn and judge, often without grounds or at least without knowing the full facts. How can we know what is right and what is wrong? How can we be freed from the manipulation of false guilt? How can we be free from the condemnation of our own conscience? 
How can we defend ourselves from the adverse impact of the flawed judgments of others? Praise God, he's revealed his absolute values of right and wrong through his laws, testimonies, statutes, precepts, commands, ordinances, words and promises. The eagle-eyed among you will notice that I said there were eight Hebrew words for God's word and then only listed seven last time. Sorry about that. It does serve to prove that I'm not perfect. I'll leave you to work out which one I missed out last time. Through these, we can know what we should rightly be ashamed of and what we are guilty of. So two weeks ago, I introduced this new series on Psalm 119, Life from A to Z. If you haven't listened to that talk yet, then I recommend you do that first to give you some understanding of the overall purpose and structure of the psalm. This week, we're looking at more depth in verses 1 to 8. Eight verses, all starting with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. As all the sections of the psalm, the only connections between the eight verses are that they all start with the same letter and they all fit with the overall theme of praise for God's word. Beyond that, it's a case of what else does the letter A make me think of? So each verse stands alone, but for the purposes of the series, I'm taking it a section at a time and highlighting a different aspect for each stanza. Today, we're thinking about being blessed and blameless. Let's work our way through this section. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Mention of the word blessing in relation to God's law should immediately bring back to our minds the blessings and curses which accompanied the giving of the covenant to Israel in Deuteronomy 27 to 28, 68. Through the law, God revealed his requirements and made clear that obedience and disobedience would have consequences. By entering into the covenant, Israel accepted these terms and conditions. Broadly speaking, blessings meant good things would happen and curses meant bad things would happen. For the Christian, especially one who's been following our teaching for a while, the mention of blessing should also bring to mind the Sermon on the Mount. In this, Jesus brought a fresh revelation of what it meant to be blessed. Blessing is rooted not in short-term gain, but in being people who reflect the nature and purpose of God and hence show themselves to be his children. For a Jewish priest to declare blessing for those who obey the law is unsurprising. What we might find more challenging is the word blameless. Indeed, that was the first thing that struck us in our studies of this psalm in our small group. Who are these blameless people? Surely all have sinned. We've all broken God's laws. Quite right. Apart from Jesus, a very important exception, to which I'll return later, everyone has fallen short of perfection. But the writer doesn't have in mind a group of people who have kept the law perfectly, but lays down a principle that walking according to the law of the Lord is what makes us blameless. It is also significant that it's the behaviour of those obeying the law which is blameless, not that the people are always obeying the law. The law provides a means for making amends for unintentional wrongdoing, sin, through repentance and sacrifice. In this way, the sinner sought forgiveness and became blameless again before God. The first verse speaks about walking according to the law. This is about a way of life, not a legal perfection at every point. It's more demanding in that it covers the whole of life rather than keeping the letter of the law, but it's also more achievable because it requires a right heart and a right spirit, not perfection in keeping law. Verses 2 to 4 form the next thought. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. When we seek God with all our heart, and keep his statutes, we're kept from error. Wholeheartedness is an important concept throughout the psalm. It means our intellect and our will and our emotions. It corresponds with Jesus' teaching to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 
which is a direct quote of Moses, who made that comment on the commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. How can we show our love for God? By fully obeying his precepts. Jesus taught us that those who loved him would obey his commands. He summed up God's command as loving God and loving each other. So far so predictable. The priest is saying that God's law is good, it's good for us if we obey it, and it's the right thing to do. Then we read this in verses 5 and 6. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. At this point, the psalm comes to life with a reality of spiritual experience. Do you see the cry of the psalmist? Oh, that my ways were steadfast. It's a heart cry. The psalmist is convinced that God's way is the best way. But I think it's strongly implied that when he considers God's commands, he's put to shame because he's not been steadfast in obeying them. And this is where the psalm comes to life for us too. We can recognise the experiences common to all those who set out to live a life in obedience to God. The psalmist commits to praise God as he continues to learn and provided that God does not utterly forsake him. He puts this confidence not in his own righteousness, but in God's ability to teach him to obey. Verse 7 and 8. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. How can we apply this? I began by speaking about shame and guilt. As the psalmist studies God's commands, he sees that they are perfect, but he is not. He's put to shame. Shame is where your guilt impacts on who you are as a person. It's not simply admitting a technical failing. It goes to the core of who you are. Not simply that you've done wrong, but that you are wrong. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 7 verse 22 to chapter 8 verse 2. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Paul and the psalmist delight in God's law, and they know what they should do, and they want to do it, but they recognise that they do not have the ability to do so wholeheartedly without God's help. The psalmist will seek God's help in teaching him and Paul goes on to thank God for Jesus who delivers him from this endless battle with his sinful nature. Paul proclaims there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. They are blameless. The New Testament has quite a lot to say about being blameless. The word is used 14 times. As the commentator Wearsby writes, only Jesus Christ was totally blameless in his relationship to God and his law. But because believers are in Christ, we are holy and without blame before him. His love is in our hearts and his spirit enables us. So his law is not a heavy yoke that crushes us, for his commandments are not burdensome. For those in Christ, there is no condemnation they are blameless before God. They are blameless only because Jesus has borne the curse of the law on the cross in their place, not because they've never sinned. It is pre precisely because Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin, that he's able to take our blame and, in its place, offer the blessings of his perfect obedience. The psalmist couldn't have known how God would finally enable him to be blameless but he was prepared to put his faith in God's love for him 
rather than his own perfection. So he too was saved by faith. The biblical response to shame and guilt, which we feel in the light of God's word, is not to deny them or to harden our hearts to them, not to justify ourselves, but to come to repentance. Repentance is a change of mind about who we are and who God is that leads to a change of behaviour. It can involve realising the meaning of God's word more clearly, but sometimes it's simply realising that the core of who we are has been corrupted. We need a new heart and the renewal of a right spirit. Acknowledging our shame and guilt and responding appropriately to them brings transformation. Denying them leads us under their debilitating grip. As King David writes in Psalm 32, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Transformation starts with confession, that is agreeing with God's assessment of the situation. Confession before God is an important part of true repentance. It may also involve seeking the forgiveness of those we've hurt and putting right what we can. When we do this the first time, we enter into a new relationship with God. He adopts us into his family and fills us with his spirit. We are then in Christ. We are a new creation. It's this unity with Christ and rebirth which is signified through baptism where we are immersed in water. God continues to deal with rightful shame and guilt by first accepting us as we are and declaring his unmerited love towards us displayed in Christ. God has removed the curse of the law for all who put their faith in him through the cross. But we still sin and we still feel guilt and shame. The Spirit convicts us of the specific sin and leads us to repentance. Through this ongoing process we remain in Christ and when we meet him face to face we will be like him. The emotions of shame and guilt are not wrong in themselves. They're a prompt to go to God, to confess to him where we're failing and seek the power of the Spirit to begin again and through repentance we receive forgiveness. The Spirit of God never leaves us with a vague sense of being shameful or guilty without bringing us to repentance. It's the enemy who seeks to use false shame and guilt in this way. God sets us free from false shame and false guilt by making clear what he requires of us. Others may judge us, Satan may accuse us, but if we honour God above the opinion of others, then we are released from their flawed judgment of us as we value the acceptance and forgiveness of our Heavenly Father so much more highly. God declares that Jesus has paid the price for our sin in full. There is no more to pay. What we need to do is confess our sin and accept his forgiveness. We are then blameless in his sight. How might we respond? Do you feel guilt and shame even as you're listening to this talk? Where are those feelings coming from? Have you put your trust in the promise that Jesus has died in your place so that all your sin can be forgiven? Did Jesus not pay enough? The Father says he did. The Gospel says that there is forgiveness through repentance. This is not easy. It may involve some heartbreak and tears as you come to terms with the true cost of your guilt displayed on the cross. It's not easy. But it is simple and the outcome is reconciliation with your Heavenly Father and a new life in Christ. If the feelings are not coming from the Spirit but are a vague sense that you're not good enough or a constant reminder of the failings of your past, then it's likely your own misguided conscience or the accuser. Take these feelings to the cross and declare them dead and buried. In this way anyone can be blessed and blameless in the sight of God. Let's pray. 
Holy Spirit of God, we hold ourselves before you. We recognise that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The penalty of sin is death. We thank you that through Jesus Christ, you took that punishment and you offer us forgiveness through repentance. We invite you, Holy Spirit of God, to convict us of our sin so that we might be free from guilt and shame. Release us, O Lord, and fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might more closely follow your teaching and leading revealed in Jesus Christ. We ask these things for your glory, for the building up of your church. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so that brings our time together to an end. Um, thank you to everybody who's taken part. Please stay um, uh, tuned. <laughs> um, Mike's chosen some songs uh, for a worship time after uh, this part of the service. Um, thank you to Andy, who's um, stitched everything together again. And um, if this is your first time of, of um, listening to our our uh, services please do get in touch we'd love to hear from you um, and the details will be coming up after after this uh, just like to close with um, a verse that uh, is part of a passage that I've been looking at this week it's in uh, Philippians uh, Philippians chapter 2 so to, to encourage you continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you amen <laughs>